Namaskar and welcome to Diplomatic Dispatch, the show that brings you insights into the latest developments on the international front. I am your host, Vikas Swaroop. On the 14th of July, President Joe Biden convened the first summit of the four-nation grouping I2U2, where the I2 stands for India and Israel, and the U2 stands for the United States of America and the United Arab Emirates. And that will be the focus of today's show. The I2U2 grouping was conceptualized during a meeting of the foreign ministers of the four countries held on October 18 last year. Following the Abraham Accords of 2020, which marked the normalization of relations between Israel and three Arab countries, UAE, Bahrain and Morocco. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, President Joe Biden, Israeli Prime Minister Yair Lapid and President Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan of the UAE participated in the virtual summit which focused on joint investments and new initiatives in six specific areas of water, energy, transportation, space, health and food security. Speaking at the summit, Prime Minister Modi said, this is a meeting of strategic partners in the true sense. By mobilizing the mutual strengths of our countries, capital, expertise and markets, we can accelerate our agenda and make significant contributions to energy security, food security and economic growth on a global scale. A joint statement by the four leaders said, the UAE will invest $2 billion to develop a series of integrated food parks across India with the support of American and Israeli private sector experts. These parks will help maximize crop yields and in turn help tackle food insecurity in South Asia and the Middle East. President Biden said this project has the potential to sustainably increase India's food yields by threefold in just five years. The objectives of the project also include reducing trade barriers between the economies of the four countries and harmonizing the food safety and quality standards. The initial list of crops identified for the project includes banana, potato, rice, spices and onions. The joint statement also mentioned that the I2U2 group will advance a hybrid renewable energy project in Gujarat consisting of 300 megawatts of wind and solar capacity to be complemented by a battery energy storage system. The four countries also intend to mobilize private sector capital and expertise to modernize infrastructure, advance low carbon development pathways for their industries, improve public health and access to vaccines, advance physical connectivity between countries in the Middle East region, jointly create new solutions for waste treatment, explore joint financing opportunities, connect their startups to I2U2 investments and promote the development of critical emerging and green technologies. In the area of fintech, India highlighted the importance and the doability of expanding the UPI payment system across the other three partner countries. To learn more about the I2U2 and its geopolitical significance, I am joined by two distinguished guests. His Excellency Naor Gilon is the Ambassador of Israel to India, Sri Lanka and Bhutan and former Ambassador to Italy and the Netherlands. His vast experience includes the role of Foreign Policy Advisor to three Prime Ministers. Ambassador Naftej Sarna is a veteran Indian diplomat and writer who did postings as India's Ambassador to Israel, the UK and the US. At headquarters, he was the longest serving official spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs and Secretary West. Let me begin with you, Ambassador Sarna. The I2U2 grouping is a reflection of India's growing engagement with the countries of West Asia, including Israel. Since 2014, India has developed much closer relations with these countries, led by Prime Minister Modi himself. Why is this region important to India? Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, Vikas, for inviting me here. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I think these relations are very old. Uh, with this area. You know, we, we don't call it the Middle East like the rest of the world. We call it West Asia because we, are, we see ourselves on the same continent. So in many ways, this is the extended neighborhood of India. And we've had old relations with this part of the world uh, across the seas, across land, cultural relations, uh, 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 relations of language, relations of... Uh, you know, shared relations, links between empires and so on and so forth. But, of course, in today's world, 
This region is, is a major supplier of our oil and natural gas. A large chunk, 50 to 60 percent, uh, comes from this area. Uh, we have an expanding diaspora. Uh, and the figure uh, seems to increase every week. I mean, you'll read fig today, if you look up on the net, you'll see 7 billion, 8 billion, 9 billion people. Significant remittances. Uh, the last figure I saw was about $40 billion uh, coming uh, from this area. And of course, the strategic importance because of the strategic relations we have developed with Israel, uh, with the UAE, uh, and, with, and with other countries. Uh, so India has uh, peace and security in this area uh, as a major requirement so that we can promote our interests in terms of access to technology, access to energy, and also as a market, both for our people and for our goods. Ambassador Gilon, what makes the I2U2 such a unique grouping? So thank you, Vikas, for having me here. It's really a pleasure. I think that what is very interesting about the group, look geographically at the map, there are no common borders between the countries, but there are a lot of common interests, I believe, and common, common also uh, values. And that's what we are trying to do, I think, in this group. People all the time are asking me, is it going to be against China, against Iran? Each one is trying to pull it to his direction. And I'm answering always, it's not against anyone. It's for, it's a positive approach trying to make the lives of our peoples better and the world a better place to live in. So I think this is very unique and the idea here is that the government will hand over, will facilitate, but hand over to the private sector these uh, projects that you mentioned, some of them in the opening, which are supposed to make this world really a better place in, in environment, in water, in food supplies, food security. And I think it's a really nice initiative and has a huge potential because there is a lot of uh, 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 compatibility between mm -hmm. our countries. So I think the relations, UAE has excellent relations with, uh, with India, but also now with Israel since the Abraham Accords. US, of course, is a player. We bring technology, you bring technology, you bring market size. In, uh, UAE has both technology and the uh, ability to bring financing. US has everything. So it's, it's a win-win, uh, I think, program idea. Now, as you mentioned, the I2U2 would not have been possible without the Abraham Accords. How transformative were these accords and what kind of a shift in regional politics did they represent? I think that the Abraham Accords are a tremendous shift because we have already peace accords, very important peace accords with important neighbors like Egypt and Jordan, uh, Egypt from the late 70s. But these were countries that had a problem with Israel, a direct problem, a border problem, a land problem, and there was land swap or land agreement included in these agreements. But now we are widening the scope. For many years, the Palestinian issue was the issue that prevented these countries from getting closer, officially getting closer to Israel. And uh, now you can see that from Morocco, where our chief of staff is now going to visit for the first time ever, to Bahrain, to UAE, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was in Oman, I think like three years ago or so. So things are really shifting. These countries had no direct conflict with Israel. On the contrary, if I may say, one of the things that pushed them closer to Israel is the fear of Iran. Because Israel was perceived in the region as the country which is standing against Iran the strongest, starting with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu at the time going to Congress even to confront the American president on the issue of Iran. Uh, our uh, opposition to the agreement, OPCW, uh, oh, <laughs> to the agreement there. And, uh, and I think that this was, in a way, uh, th something that pushed them to make it public, the relations with Israel. Ambassador Sanna, now India had welcomed the accords, uh, highlighting its support for mechanisms that offer peace and stability in the region. What is their larger utility for India? Well, clearly, you know, if, uh, we have very important relationship with Israel as well as with UAE. And if their relationship improves, uh, it's, it gives us more elbow room in our foreign policy. And the obvious synergies which Ambassador Gillon mentioned are there. We, you know, we use Israeli technology, cutting-edge technology that is, Israel has, use the Emirati capital, and use the Indian scale uh, and the Indian uh, outreach to other countries uh, eventually. Uh, you know, the UAE had $75 billion uh, 
inkmarked for sending to India's investment. But for the last year, it's not really happened. Only parts of it have yes. happened. You know, part of it is the lack of an FTA, which has now happened. Part of it is COVID. But also, part of it is real projects. And this kind of thing will, will help us actualize these, uh, this. And it also, in, you know, uh, strengthens and is strengthened by our relationship with the United States. Uh, because it's not just the Abraham Accords, it's the fact that India has in developed its relationship with all these three partners quite independently of each other, but in parallel over the last two decades. Turning back to the I2U2 summit, what was the reason for convening the summit at this point in time? Well, I think there's a, I, I'm not sure if this is a, uh, you know, certain strategic reason for the timing and one should be careful because this is, at the moment, the partners themselves are not trying to make it a strategic summit. Uh, I think the six months ago or last October, the idea started. The Sherpas have been meeting regularly. The working groups have been uh, evolving the concepts. And obviously, when um, President Biden was coming uh, to the region, this was a good opportunity. As, as uh, you know, I, I can imagine diplomats working it out that why not sort of do this also since we have the papers. But having said that, I would say that the timing does resonate uh, because, you know, of course, the unsaid thing is about China, Russia, and even Turkey uh, getting together in uh, Tehran today. We can discuss that if you like. Uh, at the same time, you have uh, the fact that because of the Ukraine crisis, mm -hmm. food, fuel uh, has, have become an issue. Energy is a major issue and, you know, oil prices uh, are, an, are an issue. So the fact that these two projects have been selected uh, does have a resonance. Ambassador Gillon, why is food and energy security particularly important and critical to your region? I think it's important to the whole world now. We see what, uh, what are the consequences of the war in Ukraine, that uh, Ukraine and Russia, two of the biggest suppliers of wheat mm. for the world, are now exporting in different modes and there is pressure on the wheat market in the world, energy, what's happening. So I think that, uh, you know, all of us, uh, when we have people who are less privileged, it's very hard to have them under uh, uh, democracy. People who are hungry cannot be well into it. Democracy has to have people who are well-educated, well-fed, uh, have the basic needs of life. So I think in order to prevent pressure on, on the regimes around the world, in the Middle East especially, uh, but also in India, also in other places in the world, it's very important to have food security for the people. This is the, the basic element that the government, governments around the world, have to provide to their people. And that's why it's important in the Middle East. We don't want to have the instability. We had enough around ISIS, uh, so-called Arab Spring and everything. And we are now trying to rebuild, I hope, the world into a better future. Now, Ambassador Sarna, as Ambassador Gillon mentioned earlier, some analysts have said that the formation of I2U2 is a strategic attempt by the United States to check China's increasing influence in Asia and the Middle East. And that is why in the popular parlance, it was initially dubbed the West Asian Quad. What is your take? Well, my take is that that is the subtext. Uh, but that has been the subtext in the original Quad also. And we have not been talking too much about it because we still call that Quad in the Indo-Pacific is an inclusive concept as long as you play by the rules, knowing very well that China wants to make its own rules. Uh, in, in this particular setup also, I think there would be some partners, uh, possibly the United States primarily, uh, India a little more cautiously, uh, which would say that, yes, this is a good way to counter Chinese influence. But gradually and slowly, that's why we are talking of food security and we are not talking of security. Uh, at the same time, I would say that, and I, I say this advisedly in the presence of the Israeli ambassador, that for Israel and for uh, UAE, uh, they would perhaps be far more cautious, given the fact that in recent years, uh, there's, uh, the stakes of Chinese engagement with these countries have increased. Uh, China is a major uh, trade partner uh, for UAE, a major importer of oil, 
China has also been exporting considerably much more in the last 10 years to Israel, has increased its investment, although that has now seems to have tapered off a bit in infrastructure projects. So given all that, I don't think anybody wants to uh, immediately make this anti-China uh, 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 engagement. And we haven't even talked of the other big grey thing in the room, uh, which is Iran. Yes. Uh, so, you know, tomorrow you'll call it an anti-Iran and then India uh, will, uh, you know, yes, and, and we UAE. Have, we have good relations and with UAE Iran as well. And will, UAE will say no, no. no. So, as the ambassador said, this is being projected and being conceived at the moment as an economic um, um, gathering with a, a project-driven paradigm as well as a kind of positive agenda rather than an anti-agenda. So while, you know, these things are lurking around, I think people are skirting these issues. Excellency Gilon, now at the summit, the leaders also welcome <coughs> India's interest in joining the US, the UAE and Israel in the Agriculture Innovation Mission for Climate Initiative, Aim for Climate. Tell us something more about this initiative. Well, in general, uh, we are trying to create more efficiency, I think, in agriculture around the world, including in India. Israel has been doing it in India for the last uh, 25 years yes. or so. We have uh, about 30 centers of excellence. And the idea is the, to try and increase the productivity. It's, it's a big problem. Because of climate change, irrigation is very much needed because water is not stable anymore, and the heat and the coolness, so you have to have a controlled or semi-controlled environment for the plants to grow. In order to have, in our, for example, in our centers of excellence, the average farmer, by the way, he doesn't see an Israeli expert there. It's all done by Indian counterparts here, and also he gets 70% of subsidy for the, for the uh, uh, in whatever he would pr uh, procure, whatever the technology would procure, they have four times the yield in a very simple technology at that level. So we believe that if we work smart and we bring higher technology, better technology, what uh, the typical small farmer cannot uh, economically or physically adopt, uh, we can increase a fewfold the supply of food from the same area, same kind of area and this is I think the future of the world because we are becoming more and more people and uh, less and less uh, areas that we can grow in. So this is the idea, bring high tech into agriculture, having a lot of production off season all year around. There are many things that can be done. Mm -hmm. Apart from agriculture, Ambassador Sarna, energy was the other dominant theme of the summit uh, and the ITU2, as I had said earlier, announced the setting up of a 300 megawatt wind and solar project in Gujarat. Do such projects have the potential to make India a global hub for alternative supply chains in the renewable energy sector? But theoretically, yes. Uh, but we have to see how this project go, and maybe it takes more than one project uh, to make us a global hub. Because the important thing about this project is, A, it's hybrid, it's got solar and wind. But the third factor, which is that it has got a battery enhancement uh, kind of technology uh, uh, attached to it, and as you know, the major problem with you know, putting the renewable energy into grids is, is, is battery life. And that is an interesting development, given the fact that the U.S. technology is going to be used to develop that, uh, uh, that kind of uh, backup. And possibly if, we, if it succeeds, and hopefully it shall, we'll have some more of these. And then, of course, not only will it help us meet our target of 50 JW of renewable by 2030, but also expand to other areas of uh, South Asia and the rest of the world. Ambassador Gilon, since we have you here, let us expand the discussion to India-Israel relations. Mm -hmm. Now this year, India and Israel celebrate 30 years of diplomatic ties. Tell us, how have relations between India and Israel transformed during these three decades? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I would start even in the establishment of the Israel and remember that uh, India, very young India, a few months old, voted against the separation resolution in uh, uh, 1947, resolution 181, uh, which was the establishment of two states at the time. Uh, and then in 53, 50 we established diplomatic relations, 53 we opened uh, our consulate yes, in Mumbai, Mumbai without having reciprocity. 
and it was hard life for these diplomats. The, their accessibility was limited. But then, in '92, we established full diplomatic relations. And I think that since then, it was growing very steadily, the relations very strong. We had many, I think, basically two, two uh, uh, legs or uh, bases to this relation. One was the defense cooperation, which was already then quite strong. And the other one was the agriculture that I've mentioned. But there was a big shift, I believe, in 2017, the historical visit of Prime Minister Modi to Israel and a year later, Prime Minister Netanyahu visiting here. We elevated the relations at the first visit already to strategic partnership, as Prime Minister Modi also said in the I2U2, uh, uh, mentioned that they are strategic partners. But beyond the, elevate, the formal elevation, there was a practical elevation. Today, I cannot speak of two bases or feet to legs to our relations. We have so many. We are cooperating in everything today. And it's really amazing to see uh, we are work working now on the FTA agreement. We have a lot of defense cooperation still going on, but we have in all fields. And this is really amazing. I came to the relations in a time where they are in a certain peak, I believe. And the, the, I think my, my challenge would be to maintain this wonderful growth. We are now at around $6 billion of trade uh, between us without defense. Uh, and one million of services out of it. And we are very strong, both of us, in services, IT services and computer and high-tech. So I think that the potential is still humongous. We can do a lot together. Now, Israel is known as the startup nation, and several world-beating startups have come out of Israel. It has, the most unicorn, <clears throat> it has the most unicorns per capita in the world. Now, India now also has 105 unicorns and the third largest startup ecosystem in the world. Can you tell us what are the main pillars of the Israeli innovation economy? And how are India and Israel working together to combine their strength in this very, very important area? Yeah, uh, the, we were quite early into startups. I think it's part of the, of the character of the Israelis. Uh, the military, compulsory military service had a lot to do with it because we built an, a technological military and we took the brightest at the age of 18 and put them into the technological units. So you put young, bright people together, good things come out in the military. And when they leave the military service, they do it outside. And many of the startups started there. When you look at Israel today, it's a very rich ecosystem. So we are really spread over 7,000 startups for a country of 9 million people, uh, spread about around everything. We are very strong in cyber but also artificial intelligence. Even in uh, EVs, in uh, electric vehicles, we don't produce vehicles, but a lot of te supporting mm. technologies, autonomous cars. Uh, in every field almost that you look at, you would find Israeli companies, medical devices, very strong. So, and I believe that, you know, you have both the technology and scalability. One of the issues of Israel, we are a de facto island. Although we have neighbors, uh, these are not neighbors that are part of our open market, let's call it this way. They are friendly, they're, we have peace accords with them, with some of them. Uh, with Lebanon and Syria, of course, we are still in the state of conflict. But uh, having a big market uh, like India and a smart market like India, I think for us it's a huge potential. We were always looking, by the way, traditionally to the US and then to Europe. And I think that it's slowly shifting uh, both India, China was before, and now maybe India is now more uh, in, the, in the driving seat in this sense. Ambassador Sarna, on the 14th of July, Adani Ports won the tender for the privatization of Israel's Haifa port, which is a major trade hub on the country's Mediterranean coast. How significant is this development? I think it's a very significant development because uh, Haifa is a strategic port. Uh, and Haifa has historical links with India. You know, the Indian Lancers liberated Haifa yes. from the Ottomans in 1918. Uh, but more importantly than that, it's, it's a port which Israel has been trying to privatize. And there was some controversy because a part of the port or an additional uh, port there was given to China. And I think there was some, uh, some um, raised eyebrows in many circles, including in the United States, because the U.S. Sixth Fleet uses that port. 
Uh, so obviously, they didn't want uh, too much of China. But then one of the spin-offs of the Abraham Accords was that the UAE has stepped forth and put a lot of capital uh, in that port. And again, I think now the Indian company has, has moved in. So perhaps this is a sign of uh, major Indian companies moving into infrastructural investment in Israel. Uh, and that will, be, that will be an upgrade. Uh, of the relationships, uh, because you know we've we've had a lot of other exchanges, but I don't I don't remember a major company getting into infrastructure mm -hmm. um, in in Israel. Uh, My final question: How do both of you see the future of I two U two, Ambassador Gidon? Well, I'm optimistic because I think that the direction is right, and I believe that we can uh, go on. It, it depends a lot of the governments because. The idea of going to private sector, outsourcing it to private sector is the best idea one can have. But we as government have to facilitate because if we want to have farms, local governments will have to facilitate that. If we have to wind farms, solar farms, agricultural farms. So we will have to be very efficient as governments in uh, putting aside the obstacles and letting the people who know how to do the work in the private sector do the work. So I, if, if we are smart in doing it, this is the concept, we will succeed. And also because, as I said before, it's not against anyone, it's for. And when you asked before questions about uh, will India export uh, energy, clean, uh, clean energy, I think that India will be able to export the technology, the know-how, because a lot of know-how will be accumulated here. And a lot of knowledge and companies will accumulate that. And this will be another leg or another basis for India's prosperity, I believe. So I, I, I'm a true believer in uh, I2U2. Too. Ambassador Sarna? Well, I think it started well. And as long as, um, you know, it sticks to this area of, uh, you know, economic cooperation and these chosen areas, uh, it should do well. But, but of course, as the ambassador said, I think it is in going to be increasingly private sector driven. And uh, as long as that investment keeps coming through, that expertise keeps coming through, uh, these these projects should succeed. And if they do, I think it's it's a win-win for everybody involved. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Gillon and Ambassador Sarna, for your insights. As Prime Minister Modi said, it is clear that the vision and agenda of I2U2 is progressive and practical. As this new group navigates its way through a complex geopolitical environment, India will play a pivotal role in this grouping, which aims to harness the vibrancy and entrepreneurial spirit of four partners to tackle some of the greatest challenges confronting our world. That is all I have for you in this edition of Diplomatic Dispatch. Thank you for watching and goodbye.